So summertime is really here and the news is heating up this week, too. But we've got you covered. I'm here with co-host David Figler and Nevada Independent reporter Jacob Solis. And today on CityCast Las Vegas, we're talking about the last two strip casinos to maybe unionize, ethics investigations into politicians wearing metro uniforms, and the casino con man who almost made off with one million (laughs) dollars. It's Friday, June 30th. I'm Vogue Robinson, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Good morning, David. Good morning, Jacob. How are y'all? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Doing great. Hey, guys. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about our casino workers handling business. Uh, I know it's been a long, long battle, but the Venetian and the Palazzo are the last two strip casino holdouts. And it's looking like they have come to an agreement to allow union organizing. David, can you give us some of those details? Yeah, I'll try to do it quickly because the history of unions in Las Vegas is deep and complex. But certainly the Culinary Union uh, is the biggest union in Nevada, maybe one of the biggest in the country. And they have a lot of affiliates, bartenders, teamsters, etc. The Venetian and the Palazzo have been holdouts uh, to the extent that the former owner, Sheldon Adelson, was a vehemently anti-union person in the way that he fought the efforts of the union uh, was twofold. One, uh, offer really incredible benefits to all his people who work there so they wouldn't want to have that come in. And two, do what most management does, which is actively fight uh, union efforts to come in and get the people to vote because it literally comes down to a vote. And what this agreement does is it says the Venetian and the Palazzo will stand by neutral as the organizing effort occurs. So as, and we could compare and contrast this to the Stations Casino, which will fight till their very last slot machine is operating, it seems, (laughs) to engage in efforts to uh, dissuade, and that's a polite way to say it, workers to join the union. Uh, So what Venetia and Palazzo are doing is what's called card neutrality. uh, So you don't have to have a uh, National Labor Relations Board election. You just put in your cards. There's some supervision to make sure everything's fair. And if the workers want it, then Culinary Union represents Venetian and Palazzo. And if the workers don't want it, then it's business as usual. Is there like a timeline for how this is all going to shake down? Yeah, um, it, it's going to be uh, a process now. Uh, you know, the the Culinary Union is actually involved in negotiations with all of the strip hotels. Uh, that was supposed to be done by June 1st. Uh, but instead of going the route of like going to a strike or something like that, because that's another thing that unions can do to wield their power if negotiations aren't going well, uh, they're in ongoing negotiations. So I think with this prize of having the Venetian and the Palazzo do card neutrality, uh, they're going to move fairly quickly to uh, get that vote going. But it's still a process. I mean, they still have to convince workers that paying the union dues and being part of a complicated union uh, that involves itself in a lot of political things that may or may not be related to the workers' best interests uh, is what they want to have. And so I I think that will play out over the next few months with regard to specific timelines. Mm. And I feel like there's a lot of benefits that come from union membership. Obviously, sometimes people's wages get increased. Um, You know, they negotiate for better insurance for the staff. And I know during the pandemic, uh, the housekeepers won an agreement to keep cleaning the rooms daily just to give them better job security. Um, But I'm curious, Jacob, you know, why are some hospitality workers hesitant to join a union? Like, what are some of the pros and cons there? Well, I think David kind of highlighted some of the big ones, right? I, paying union dues can sometimes no small percentage of your pay, right? And it's something that you will notice. Um, and I think for a lot of hospitality workers who may not be paid tremendously, right, that's something that they're paying attention to. But I think secondly, the culinary union, probably more so than any other union in Nevada, maybe save the teachers unions, is probably the most politically active union. And whether or not your politics align with what they're doing, I think is pretty important to those union members, because they're they're pretty unif- unified. And to be very specific, I mean, they support Democrats. But not all Democrats, Jacob. That's right. I mean, <laughs> they, they certainly weren't happy with Bernie Sanders when he said, uh, I want Medicare for all. 
And the union's like, oh, that's not in our best interest. So they actively went after Bernie uh, here in Nevada, right? That's right. And I'd say that the culinary specifically has some pretty idiosyncratic interests um, that it pursues. And they're not always successful. And I think that even now, at this particular legislative session, the culinary wanted a lot and didn't get a lot. Um, you mentioned the uh, the daily room cleaning. Well, the legislature got rid of that, despite the culinary putting out mailers, basically telling people, uh, here's the Democrats who are going to vote against daily room cleaning. And so uh, I think there's a question of the effectiveness of the culinary, maybe not as an electoral tool to elect Democrats, because they can certainly do that, but as a political tool to get what they want out of state lawmakers, which I think it was less effective this session. Ah. Yeah, I remember them backing the the lottery. <laughs> and I was like, we, we all were like, why is the culinary union care about the lottery of all things? And saying, oh, because the money from lottery ticket sales will support youth mental health. And we were just like, what? Mind your business? Theoretically, but also... You're saying there's no downside of adding a new stream of gambling into our ecosystem? Uh, very odd. Like Jacob said, idiosyncratic. Do y'all think that like the Venetian and the Palazzo employees will join the culinary and bartenders unions this year? <laughs> Jacob, your face. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good question. I don't know, and it's so tough to say because, like you say, I mean, one of the big reasons they they weren't unionized up to this point were those benefits, right? It's being able to say that like, oh, even if we're not unionized, we're gonna get X, Y, Z. You know, with the Venetian and Palazzo under new ownership, it's so difficult to say whether or not that will continue in the future. And maybe that's something that might push someone who's on the edge towards unionization. But it's just, you know, is that enough to get voluntary recognition? I think there's a lot of questions. Mm. Without the constant management pounding away at the disadvantages of union, it probably makes it a lot more likely. But that doesn't stop fellow workers from having robust conversations about whether they want the union or not with their fellow workers. Yeah, I think it passes uh, through. I think that a majority of workers recognize that Las Vegas is a union town uh, and that they want to be a part of it. But uh, I don't know that it is as done a deal as a lot of people think it is, though mm. it'll be interesting to see where management is not involved in the process of trying to dissuade people if it still fails. That would be really interesting as far as culinary's influence in the town. Mm. Yeah, one of the floor attendants uh, from the Venetian, Gladys Henderson, who'd been working there fi for 15 years, uh, she said her and her coworkers are excited for what the future holds and they're grateful to have the opportunity. So I think it's really about them being able to have the option and to have those conversations. So whatever they do, I'm glad they get to have they get to have the conversations, the discussions, and then they get to make the decision for themselves. So we'll see what happens. So a Henderson councilman, Jim Seabach, is under an ethics investigation for using his Metro un uniform while campaigning. That sounds very familiar to a lovely governor. Jacob, break this down for us. Yeah. So, I mean, it is what it sounds like on the tin, right? So Jim Seabach is a Henderson city councilman now or soon to be, and he is an assistant uh, uh, sheriff in Metro. And he used in a mailer his police uniform. And the Ethics Commission is now investigating that. And like you said, it sounds very similar to what maybe Governor Joe Lombardo did, except much more limited, it sounds like. It sounds like it was just this one mailer, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not stopping the Ethics Commission. They're, they're still taking a look at this. And this is all based sort of on a 2019 memo that the commission sent out to Metro basically saying, please don't use your cop uniform to campaign. You're not allowed to. Um, that hasn't stopped them. So now we're here. Oh, my God. Well, what's like the ethical violation here? Because, I mean, what makes this different from wearing your pastor's clerical collar or a veteran wearing their military uniform in a political ad? Like, I think for many of us who are like who read up on a candidate or listen to a candidate's speech, they they're going to bring up what they did previously. Well, the special sauce here is uh, or the term of art, I guess, is accoutrements of office. So in this case, because they're public employees being police officers, using that public uniform for something like campaigning makes it problematic. Now, this is questionable insofar as like, what about veterans using military uniforms and campaign materials? They're allowed to do that. And I think it's just sort of like an open question, like it, what is the ethics of using that uniform? And I think with this Seabock case is probably a difference to the Lombardo case because Lombardo used a bunch of stuff. <laughs> 
He used his badge. He used his gun. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this old Lombardo ad from last year where he like literally there's this close up of his gun on like a nightstand. It's like pretty wild. Oh, bless his heart. Was he pulling over a motorist in that ad? No, he was and like protecting his home. Ordering them on the ground because they uh, were speeding and then they put his knee on his back? Or? They were speeding in his dreams and he woke up to stop them. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, well, could could be. So, like, I don't know. This this Seabock thing appears to just be the uniform. Um, but also, look, they haven't actually released a sort of judgment on what Seabock should face. They're just investigating right now. The Lombardo thing is interesting insofar as they recommended, I'm sure everyone remembers, like a $1.6 million fine uh, because yeah. he technically 68 separate violations for 38 <laughs> different ads he ran. <laughs> Whether or not the commission should be judging each individual instance is also, I guess, a question here. But I don't know. I'll leave it to you guys. Mm. I think a lot of people rolled their eyes that this, of all things, is what the Nevada Commission on Ethics is taking issue with and that the fines are just so big. I, I mean, I get having a memo and I get having that ignored and I get wanting to prove that you have some some power to be taken seriously. And, and that's why you would seek such great fines. I, I don't know that it resonates with the public because uh, how many voters didn't know that Joe Lombardo in that instance was the sheriff or that probably Jim Seabock was a metro officer when he was running? There were actually quite a few metro officers uh, running for office. Uh, not all of them were successful, but I think all of them sort of followed the same, if you will, suit of the accoutrement. Uh, is that what you called it, Jacob? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Yeah. So... I, I'm really surprised, though, that, you know, like I said, this is the thing where Henderson Council has all sorts of interesting ethics issues that are happening with other members. I mean, Dan Shaw's been in the news for uh, improper payday loan practices oh. and federal lawsuits. And, you know, that doesn't seem to click on the ethics board. And all that seems to be stuff that should be more concerning with regard to ethics and yet... Jacob, why don't we hear about any of that stuff? I mean, is the Nevada Commission on Ethics uh, posers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. And I don't know. I, it's very easy to file an ethics complaint with the Commission on Ethics. And sort of what they decide to pursue is unknowable. It goes into the black box of the Nevada Commission on Ethics. But uh, from what I've seen, because I cover higher ed, so that's a lot of what mm -hmm. I notice. And frankly, like a lot of the higher ed stuff that gets run through the Commission on Ethics is really esoteric. Like, should this person have really voted on this specific personnel dispute? And like, they'll spend months litigating this and then um, do nothing. So it's it's like a, I, I think it's an open question of sort of how effective the commission is at enforcing these sort of ethics rules. And I mean, how much anyone even complies with them in the first place. Well, why do you think, Jacob, that like the uniform itself is so concerning to the Nevada Commission on Ethics? Because this is the one thing they seem now to be taking up. What What do you think the problem ethically is? <sighs> That's a good question. You know, <laughs> I guess theoretically, right? It's that it is like a state, like, like, you know, it's an officer of the state. And like, if you're looking at state employees, not a lot of them can use violence against people, except cops can. So like, maybe that's a concern. Ooh, I'm dead. What? Wow. That's a hot take, my man. I love that. What is it? I feel like the, the, they literally, they, I mean, they're literally... I'm just, that's I, that's the definition of police. Uh, they're allowed to do that. Qualified immunity. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I think it's low hanging fruit, right? I think this, yeah. this is an easy thing to prove. Here's the mailer. You were wearing the outfit. We said you can't and you're wearing it. And then what is the presumed power, right? So if this is you're in your uniform and it's it's a symbol of whatever your role is. I think maybe that's a part of it, I guess, if they're just saying like you're using your power as a you're using your present power to propel you into future power yeah and i think also like lombardo has created a high profile edge to this kind of thing and now that lombardo did it i think maybe they're taking a look at other people doing it because frankly like sheriffs have not really run for higher yeah. office in nevada like lombardo was like the first sheriff to run for governor since like 1913 or something or well that's not an election year but like you know what i'm saying it's like 100 years or something like that so I think maybe there's a, now that there's the one precedent, this guy did it. Okay, now we got to check and make sure that other Metro officers aren't using the accoutrements of office to, to do the same thing. You should be running 
as average Joe. <laughs> Private citizen, not cop. Yeah. <laughs> not police officer Joe. And I think just building on that, Vogue, the, the state, the government, et cetera, is supposed to be neutral when it comes to elections, right? And when you are using your office, uh, are you not maybe even subconsciously communicating to the voters that the state or the government endorses me. Look, mm. I'm I'm still wearing the badge. I represent the government and I am running for a higher office. So, you know, I, I think that's part of that argument mm. as well. Word. So, Vogue, I guess the question is, some of these cops who wore their badges and their uniforms and their guns are now serving in, in different elected offices. What should the consequence be for breaching these ethics rules if that's what's found. I don't think fines are quite it. Like, I think fines, I think we've talked about this, but, you know, fines really have to do with, like, what is your financial status? Because money means something different depending on who you are and how much of it you have. You know, is it that there a new bill needs to be drafted? It should prompt new legislation being created so that people have, so that we're giving people these consequences faster. So, like, it shouldn't be, you know, six six months, a year after all of the campaigning is done that they're getting um, hit with consequences. So it should be, I don't know, maybe you don't get to show up, you don't get to do a particular debate or you need to come on and give an apology. You need to do two more ads where you're not in that outfit and say, my organization that I'm a part of does not you know, feel one way or the other about me being elected. So really fully retracking <laughs> the conversation and making sure that they're not leveraging whatever power might come from their own uniforms. So that's the direction I would go. I, I, I don't I'm not here for the fines because it, it's it's a slap on the wrist and it's so late for some some of the folks Some people have already been elected. What are you going to do? I'm the governor. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the question, right? I mean, Jacob, what do you think? If Jim Seabock is get, gets dinged by the Ethics uh, Commission for wearing the uniform, what should happen to him specifically that, I don't know, either punishes him or dissuades other people? Well, I don't know if I can opine on a judgment, um, but like, because, <laughs> you know, who who knows what the Ethics Commission will want. And frankly, if they follow the Lombardo model, it will probably be a lot smaller because it's not 68 violations. As <laughs> I understand, it might just be one. Um, so that's one difference. But I don't know, maybe I kind of agree that maybe there should be some look at like NRS and like, is it is this illegal? All right. If it's illegal, then what do we actually want to do about that? And like, I don't know, I think of uh, in federal races, I think if you do wear like a military uniform, you have to have like a little note in the corner of the ad that says like, this has no bearing on like the what the Navy thinks of this person. <laughs> um, and like, maybe it's as simple as that. The Navy hated this guy, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, maybe it's as simple as like, OK, maybe you are allowed to use it, but you have to put like a prominent notification on whatever mailer you put out that says that this has no like you were just a cop this doesn't mean that anyone endorses you or anything like that so right because if not that it becomes okay well then give me all of your uh not not progress reports what is it called look we haven't done those yet oh show us all of your evaluations then give if you want to tell me about your old job then i want the whole list the full resume all the details you know have you always been excellent at this job or have you had a lot of um have you been flagged for different things? So it's like how much of your past is allowed to be brought up, which makes me feel very lawyery. David, did I sound lawyery? Oh, you did. I mean, I'd love to see how many Fourth Amendment violations some uh, cop running for office had. That would be very interesting for the uh, fodder of the electorate. <laughs> Y'all, so Circa, which is the biggest hotel of downtown Las Vegas, needs to rethink their training and their safety protocols because <laughs> on June 17th at like 4.30 in the morning, <laughs> one of the employees got a call and was told to take a bunch of money, uh, apparently $1.17 million, <laughs> and distribute it all around town. Just just drive around town. Uh, so the, <laughs> the con artists, See, we're going to call them artists today. There was definitely an artisanal uh, component to it. Ask, ask the employee to Uber this money all over town. Take the terrible hearse. 
take it to uh, Circle K, take it to an AutoZone, take it to an IHOP, and then deposit some of this money into a Bitcoin ATM machine. I'm like, girl, do you know if you're getting reimbursed? <laughs> like, I feel like she needed gas reimbursement to drive all this money around town. Uh-uh, I hope she kept some personally. Um, apparently, the the scam, the way they conned this woman, uh, one of the one of the workers at the Circa was that they said that they were one of the owners of the Circa Casino because one of the brothers is very, it's owned by two brothers. One is very public and visible and the other one, I guess people just haven't seen. Like you'd have to really do some <laughs> some deep Googling to find out what the other brother looks like. So that's what they did. They called and said, I'm the owner. <laughs> Bring me some money. And then they also texted the employee and said, hey, we got to pay the fire department. So can you bring some money? <sighs> to the local gas station. <laughs> and um, I don't know how she got out of the... I just don't understand how she got out of the casino with that much money. And if she's... Because you have to have a certain rank. You have to have certain cards to be able to take money out. And there's usually checks and balances. So I just want to know... I want to know how she got out of that casino with that much money. Um, because to be that high up to have access means that you should have much, much, much better training. So we have all these casino heist movies, the, the Oceans movies, the Now You See Me, The Good Thief. And I don't know. I don't know how many people were cheering for these guys. But do you do you all <laughs> feel like it seems morally acceptable to, to rob a casino because it's a casino? Like, does it feel like mm, justifiable? It's a Robin Hood situation. Yeah, I mean, you're asking stealing it without the use of guns, because we've seen a lot of that uptick lately, and I don't think anyone's happy about that situation. Right. So you're just talking about through guiles and cleverness. Cleverness. Is that is that acceptable? Yes. Heist. Mm. Nonviolent heist. Are you, <laughs> that's a terrible question, David. Do you support nonviolent heist? <laughs> from what y'all have seen, from what you've observed, what is what do y'all feel like you've seen as far as the public response to this? I won't speak about the moral uh, of this, but uh, the, the morality rather, but uh, I respect the game uh, that they've concocted <laughs> this elaborate scheme involving phone calls and text messages. Hello, yes, this is Derek, the owner. Um, please give me $1 million. I mean, look, you, who does that? I, I mean, I don't want to be the cynical one here. And of course, I have no insider information at all, but I do have 32 years of being a criminal defense attorney. I would suggest that there is, wait for it, this is a very, very hot take, more to the story, and perhaps as often as the case as that particular razor of philosophy goes, the simplest explanation is that there's probably someone on the inside who is uh, doing some manipulations too. But I have no evidence of that, but it is going to be interesting to follow this path, but I don't know that the people really... I don't know what social media is a weird creature. It, it does seem like there's a lot of people of like, oh, they almost did it. They almost <laughs> did it. <laughs> and and they're not the only ones. You know, it, it wasn't really widely reported, but now it's coming out that this crew or crews like them mm -hmm. were doing similar things at other casinos. I I'm just my it, I'm gobsmacked because I I can't see how in this day and age with so many different protocols and security concerns and how so many of these casinos are corporatized that this still could happen. I mean, I could see it in the 60s and, you know, someone trying to rip off the binions and, you know, coming in on a horse or whatever. <laughs> I don't even know. But and then getting, you know, winding up in the middle of a desert. But this is a whole different thing. This is a whole different thing. It's it's just like baffling. Like every new detail makes no sense. And then you add more and it makes less sense. This guy was 23. Like, wait, why is she taking this money for fire equipment? This, these are you need a million dollars for fire extinguishers like any anything I learned to pay the fire department. That's what she said. She said they, at four they, in the morning, they, <laughs> four thirty in the morning. We need to pay the fire department in two days and you need to bring me the money now. I mean, if anyone's going to bust down the door, it is the fire department, I guess. But the, I don't know, <laughs> this, I, I kind of agree, I'm not kind of, I actually agree with David here because, uh, I don't know, this, there's no way that it's just one, maybe two guys. There's a, just, I don't know, mm -hmm. none of it makes sense. Right. Well, the 23-year-old guy, uh, they got his uh, license tag off of the security cameras outside of the IHOP. 
<laughs> and yes. that's how they found him. IHOP will save us all. IHOP about to save us all. I'm like, what are y'all doing? So they got it there. So for me, it's like, okay, so you drove up in your car. You know what I mean? This is a lack of planning. I need you to watch more movies, baby, because he could have got away, you know, like, and he, then he went back to his auntie's house. So I'm like, why didn't you cover up the license tag? When you got home to auntie and auntie saw that money, auntie didn't say, uh, I don't know what that is, but you better leave town, babe. Like, he should be at least in Arizona. He should have been left town. Well, you know what this reminds me of? And this is coming back from my practice. And there used to be a scam where the the brains of the operation would recruit mm-hmm. uh people who were like homeless or right. who were desperate and all they needed was a driver's license and they would give them phony paychecks mm-hmm. or phony checks to go into the casino to cash and they would post people at every exit so the person they recruited or whatever couldn't get out and then they would take all the money and give them like a six pack of beer or something. That was a real <sighs> scheme that was operating in the casinos for years and this Kind of has it shades of that. Like I think that, that the, if the person is that stupid, there's going to be a hierarchy here. Just, you know, no forethought on the poor child. No for Like, if I'm going to get a bunch of money and if you're in a tough spot, you know, I can understand not thinking that much about it. But just just the concept of, like, how do you get away with this? And it means y'all got to go. So low-key, you know, I wish that that young, young person would have left town at least. Like, at least leave town. At least watch more heist movies. Yeah. And spent the money for good. Really be a Robin Hood and like maybe go fund teenage mental health programs or something with all that money. That would have been nice. And the thing is, too, for casino workers, my sister works in a casino cage. So I know firsthand that if they overpay or underpay someone out of the cage, it's a fireable offense depending on how much it was. Like there's no conversation about it. Like they'll rehire you in three to six months after that over or underpayment. But they do not play about that. It's so sensitive in those spaces. So I, for the casino workers, it's such a risk, you know, to even try to plan anything that could possibly have be you taking money out of that space. Oh, and I imagine that the uh, the Gaming Control Board is going to have uh, some thoughts on this as well with regard to protocols and having, you know, uh, the way that financial transactions occur within a casino, which theoretically falls under their auspice. I I can't imagine that there's not going to be some investigation on how this broke down as it relates to, you know, the flow of money in casinos, et cetera, which is definitely in their purview. Mm. So let's 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 go to the shenanigans. Let's plan a heist movie, (laughs) y'all. And in this heist movie, who's going to play your main character and how would they make off with their millions? Mine, mine shall be. And this is my Vegas set casino heist movie. So a Misty Copeland is going to very de- delicately and gracefully steal money from one of the casinos with her ragtag crew of athletes. And it'll be like a cyclist, a rower, a bobsledder. They're going to use all their weird, <laughs> <laughs> phenomenal physical talents. Um, and they're bobsledding down the strip. I'm down for it. Through, through the desert. I feel like that's fine. I don't know. They're going to have like excellent formation. It's going to be during the Golden Knights parade. Oh, Look, David, come on. The, okay, that's great. <laughs> that's the cover. Yes. So the whole thing is like they, they manipulated the hockey season so that the Vegas Golden Knights won. So that would provide cover for the bobsled mm-hmm. to sneak in on the parade route. Yes. Oh, I love this. Yes, yeah. the money's going to be, they'll slide it underneath the, the, the bottom of the bobsled. So they'll be like, oh, there's nothing in it. You're fine. And then they'll be part of the, and they'll get out of town <laughs> through the parade route. That works for me. That works for me. Done. We've won the money. Jacob, add <laughs> add to this or make up your own, whichever one you want oh, to do. Oh, no. <laughs> I, have, I have a separate heist, okay. which, frankly, I'll, inspired by this one. Part two. I need a Better Call Saul-esque uh, scam. Okay. Pedro Pascal's the ringleader. Ooh. And, yeah, he just, he basically gets a bunch of, uh, look, what if, what if Ocean's Eleven, but everyone is just, they don't have it. <laughs> so I need, like, B-list con men. Um, <laughs> And he's like B plus list, the the ringleader, and so they do not get away with it mm. in this. Uh, How in do this they get thing. caught? When the cartel comes in, obviously, if it's a Better Call Saul situation, yeah. the, the cartel was like, we were doing our own heist, and you you stepped on our toes, and so the cartel kind of shuts them down, and then everyone gets exposed. There you go, Jacob. You're welcome. Or it's even stupider. It's literally like someone slips on a banana peel. <laughs> No one would leave the banana peel out, but like the like the bag man was he like has it. He's away, and then there's like an oil slick, and that's it. It's all over. <laughs> the banana peel, and they slide 
with a non-union worker who didn't clean it up. (laughs) And they slide underneath the security guard's feet with some money and go, oops. (laughs) Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. That's great. So, (laughs) Jacob and David, thank you so much for this conversation. (laughs) Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. That was fun, guys. Oh, I look forward to talking to y'all again. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. Our producers are Sonia Cho Swanson, Layla Muhammad, and A.K. Al Moomin. Our newsletter editor is Scott Dickensheets, and our hosts are David Figler and me, Vogue Robinson. Music is by OG Moose, Epidemic Sound, and All the Kimonos. We record this show on the traditional homelands of the Nuwuvi, the Southern Paiute people. If you enjoyed the show, go ahead and tell all of your friends. Then rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. All these things help, I promise. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Take care. So a Henderson councilman, uh, John C. John, I named him John today, you guys. (laughs) A Henderson councilman, John, it's still John. You did it twice? In a row, vote? That's very unlikely. Very, very unlike you. Oh, black Jesus. Okay.